everyone. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and welcome back to Build. Today, I'm sitting down with Juan Pablo de Pache, who plays Fernando, Kimmy Gibbler's ex husband and fiance on Netflix's Fuller House. He's here to talk about what can we, we can expect from the series finale and about his upcoming performances at the Green Room 42. But first, check out this clip from Fuller House. Put your hands together for Juan Pablo de Pache. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing today? Great. I'm so glad I'm here. I, I watch you guys all the time. So oh, it's, good. it's like I'm in the telly. Yes. You are. Well, you are on the telly. Also. I know, but you know, build is cool. Oh, good. I think Fuller House is cool. I just actually uh, recently talked to Andrea. We had a really good yeah. chat about the show and wrapping up. But like that clip is so amazing. And I want to know, Fernando, like how much of that was in Fernando and how much of that have they created because you are a dancer? The dancing? Yeah. And the, just, he's such a good performer. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, this weird this race car driver guy who can cut hair and also dance like yeah. a Broadway star. Um, I think, I think early on, um, I had a conversation with Jeff Franklin who created Fuller House. Um, actually, I remember he had a party at his house and he's, you know, he kind of said, do you sing? Yeah, I do actually. Do you want to sing at my party? Sure. So I think that was my audition as a singer for the show. And then from that, I think we talked about the fact that I had also danced. And so he basically just put all of that into Fernando's character. I love that. Because you uh, were on Dancing with the Stars, as was Candace Cameron Bure. And Jody Sweeten. Oh, Jody Sweeten was too. Yeah, so that yeah. probably makes those scenes even more fun because that caliber of dancing is really good compared to when you compare some maybe other shows where people try to dance. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, we have so much fun on the show, and I love the fact that that, that, that it's it's become kind of like a it, it, season three and four and five have so much music and dance in it. So so I'm you know. I love it. I'm such a sucker for New York and Broadway and all that. Oh, of course. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Hmm. Um, about the show, though, you know, let's talk about the beginning a little bit, because as we know, the first nine episodes of the final season have aired, and then the next nine are coming in 2020. Um, but I want to kind of go back to the beginning for you. Uh, when you look back at this experience, just what has it been like for you? Well, it's it's kind of amazing that they were able to recreate the success that the original show had. You know, that doesn't really happen uh, very much. And in a way, Fuller House was the beginning of the reboots because then Gilmore Girls followed and Will and Grace and Roseanne. And so we were kind of like the guinea pig and um, we didn't anticipate how, how big it got. But for me, I hadn't really watched Fuller Full House as a kid because it, we didn't get it in Argentina. And so... I was walking into something that I didn't quite know what I was walking into uh, on the first tape night. I was so nervous. Um, and uh, But I thought, okay, well, this is sort of like a reboot of a show. Let's see. And then as soon as the audience uh, were in the studio and we got those, you know, um, Beatles screams uh, when John Stamos came in and, and Bob Saget and the girls, I was like, oh, okay, I think I'm walking into a, a phenomenon that is way bigger than I even expected. And 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 actually being part of that family and being embraced into the family as if I was one of them uh, was an incredible feeling. What kind of research did you do? Because I actually had that thought when I was looking you up. I was like, yeah. oh, you didn't grow up in the States. And so yeah. what was your relationship with the show before? And then what kind of research did you do coming into Fuller House just to understand the world? Yeah, I mean... I was terrified of um, sitcoms. I, I considered myself, you know, a dramatic actor before. I had played Jesus Christ and, you know, like bad people on once TV. Once you played Jesus Christ. You know, yeah. And so <laughs> it was the perfect segue because after Jesus, I remember when people asked me, what, what's your next step? And I thought, I want something so out of left field. And so Fernando came about and it was like, oh, this is fun. But then they said, it's a sitcom. And I was terrified of them. Even though I'm, I'm a theater person, there's so much pressure to be funny. Like you have to be funny, otherwise it don't work. And so uh, it was, I was scared that I would suck. Um, and something happened, maybe it's the theater background or maybe it's that show that I found like a new kind of um, language uh, and an enjoyment in the pressure. Um, there's something kind of masochistic about performers. And sometimes when we are, when something, you know, there's a lot of pressure and we're nervous, if we challenge that energy and channel it, um, you can really have a lot of fun. So the Fuller House for me has been such a discovery in, 
in in that in in the pressure and also going with the flow in something so um, so structured because sitcom is very structured. Yeah. And working with Andrea too, I feel like that would open you up because Kimmy Gibbler yeah. is such a wacky, kooky character, and you kind of get to play a lot of your scenes with her. Yes. Her character is this larger than life guy. So what has it been like working with Andrea and just getting to like be these really fun, silly characters? Well, Andrea Barber is one in a billion. I mean, she really is such a huge talent. And both on screen and off screen, she's the most adorable human. I mean, we've really developed such a beautiful relationship and there's a chemistry with us that um, that I hope it continues in other other things because um, she's amazing. And and yeah, she her character, you could say back in the day, people laughed at her character, but nowadays Kimmy Gibbler is kind of like what we all are. Yeah. You know, we're all weirdos, yeah. really. Um, and so, and so she's embodied that so beautifully and she's allowed me to be her weirdo in crime, uh, which is, which is really, really fun. Um, I'm going to steal that for my dating profile. I'm just going to be like looking for my weirdo in crime. Absolutely. That's a great line. But we're all like we that. We are you know? all just yes. weirdos. Yes. <laughs> it's a good time to be a weirdo, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, have you guys finished all the episodes? So we finished shooting all the episodes uh, at the end of last year, uh, and uh, we premiered nine of season five, and we are waiting to see when we're going to premiere the last nine and ever of the whole history of Fuller House. What was it like uh, doing those final scenes for you guys? It was tough. I mean, there was a lot of tears from, I would say, half middle of the filming, so we were all crying for a good four months. <laughs> Uh, especially the girls. But it's a comedy. But it's a comedy. So so the tears were, you know, backstage and then we would have a laugh. That's what I loved about the show as well is the fact that you go to work and you make people laugh and you find out what is the funniest way that I can do this line or, or I can deliver this moment. Uh, the fact that we would go to work to make each other laugh and people laugh. That's such a such a rare thing. Um, so So... Yeah, I, the, the last nine episodes are amazing. Yeah. Do you amazing. have a favorite moment that we can look forward to, whether it's a scene or an episode that for Fernando is just really was really fun for you? Or I guess maybe if even there, if you're not in it. Oh, actually, there's a Fourth of July episode, I think. Um, Fernando gets his green card, maybe? It's really funny. <laughs> it's really funny. And obviously the last episode is it's it's beautiful. Uh there's a triple something. I don't know if I'm allowed to say there's a triple. I mean, did she, the, did she say something? Did Andrea say something? I feel like at the first nine, it was yeah. the Ob wedding. Yes, yes. So if you guys haven't watched it, that's on you. Okay, but the well. to be continued was, we should have a triple wedding. There you go. So that it happens. happens. That happens. <laughs> um, and it's a mess, but it's wonderful. So, so uh, and yeah. And this happens? No, that was last season. Oh, that was the last season. That already, yeah, she already had the baby. Oh, okay, okay. That's uh, uh, Stephanie's. Oh, the surrogate. Yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, sorry. I know. All right, well, there's so many, so many storylines. Yeah. Um, but So you have so much going on. You also have your one-man show, which I am really, I've seen clips of your performances and you're such a very talented singer Thank and you. performer. So tell me about the one-man show and what people can expect. Yeah, so um, uh, the one-man show is uh, at Green Room 42 this Thursday and Friday at 7 p.m. And uh, it's basically like my love letter to to the stage, to, to music, the things that I've always kind of uh, been so... Uh, you know, enamored with, and because at heart, I do all these things, I dance, I sing and act, because I'm a storyteller, so I take people through a journey of what it was like for me as an immigrant kid to have this big dream, and, and then be able to, to do what I love, um, with touching stories, with ridiculous stories, with, uh, you know, funny, funny stories, so, so it's all peppered with music that I either wrote, or uh, from from pop music, from musical theater. Uh, I'm a big musical theater geek as well. So so that's all kind of woven into the show. It's it's like a one-man musical, yeah. really. So these original songs, what is mm -hmm. your process for creating them? Do you mm -hmm. write? Do you collaborate? Because that, to me, is always something really, it seems like very daunting. It is daunting. I mean, yeah, I had to, at one point, I had to say to myself, you know, yes, you can, you can sing, you can dance, you can act, but writing music... I'm gonna leave it to the people who really know how to do it. So I, I'm in the room. I'm, 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 I collaborate uh, 
I know what I like. Uh, I know how a melody I, I want it to go, but but uh, I need to work with people because because it's such an art and it's so specific and it's so um, yeah. It takes a brain that I don't have. Yeah. For sure. So so I'll yeah. Yeah. I I in in totally putting together a show like this too. How do you create? the stories, how personal do you go? Like, what is sort of your line for that? Well, really, it's from the songs that at this point uh, I'm, like, called to sing. So if there's there's music that I, I, I have to sing the song or I'm in love with the song or, or the song that I wrote really talks about a moment. So the songs dictate what I'm talking about. And a lot of the times are the stories are connected to something that happened towards you know within maybe working on that song maybe singing that song maybe listening to that song uh but yeah i, I go personal and 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 what it was like for me to to discover how screwed up this industry is in the good and the bad um and also uh things that move me you know situations when i saw i really saw someone change um like I, I was working with disabled people um, and I really saw how this man, when I took him to the theater, how he kind of, just because he was watching a, a ballet show and he'd never been to the theater before, um, like his world changed just by watching something. Um, so, so yeah, for me, it's, it's like really talking about those moments where... Um, Art can change your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's kind of like my motto. It's the reason why I do this is because I love it so much and it has changed my life. So if I can bring any of that to to, to anyone who's watching, then, then my job is done. What is the moment in your life when music first changed your life? Because I'm sure it's happened multiple times. Yeah. But what was sort of the first moment of like, oh, this is a tool I can use. This is expression. This can help people. <laughs> Um, well, the bug. I really, I really got the bug uh, when I was seventeen, and I was in a in a boarding school, and I had never been on stage. I had only watched my sister from afar, who was an actress, and was in awe of her. But I never dared to go on stage. I was like, you know, as the shy kid in the corner drawing. Um, and uh, at seventeen, we were given a chance to do an extracurricular activity, and I kind of decided I think as a school body we should put on a musical <laughs> and, um, and so we did and we got approved and and then it was given to me like which one and I said well let's do Greece yes. and so I played Tony Manero and uh, we rehearsed so much and and on the first night when I sang the opening lines of Summer Lovin electricity just coursed through my whole body. It was just this out of body experience of, oh, I see, oh, so this is what I'm meant to be doing. So all the drawing and those ideas just went out the window and, and that was the day that I I understood. And, and it was very like direct. That day I was like, okay, if I wanna do this, I'm gonna go to the center of where they, where they teach, which in that case for me was London because I was living already in Europe. And so the train was already, you know, uh, going there. Like it was, it was a, a light bulb moment. And I know you've done theater in London and Spain, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, but you've never done Broadway here. No. Why? <laughs> I don't I've listened know. to you. I've seen you. I was like, well, uh, you can dance. You can well. sing. What has been the stopping point, or like, why hasn't that happened? Or is that something you want to happen? Yeah, of course, I want it to happen. I mean, it's definitely a a a, a, a lifelong goal of mine that I wanna I want it to happen. Uh, I've been close to it about four times. Okay. So, what other musicals usually? Are, can you name one of the musicals that you were that I was close yeah. to? Oh, I don't want to get into trouble. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was all re it was all in the last two years, and uh, it, it always had to do with being on Fuller House and and scheduling. So it's gonna happen. I'm I'm not worried about it. But the green room is a nice little probably makes you happy because it's right yeah. off of Broadway. You're like, like in the zone. Absolutely. All that energy must feel very similar. Absolutely. It's like coming into, you know, the fold of it. I feel like I'm a little bit of a part of Broadway just touching it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And I get to do, I get to be a ham, which I love, um, as you can see with Fernando. Yeah. <laughs> Are there other one-man shows or cabarets or that you yeah. really 
admire yeah. or admired that sort of helped inform your show? Absolutely. Um, for me, like the Bible of cabaret shows was at liberty with uh, Elaine Stritch. Oh, I love her. Yeah. She's so amazing. Yeah, because f that is really what it's about. When you are putting yourself on a stage, um, you want to you wanna open up to people and you want to kind of uh, um, really take them through a journey, like I was saying before. And for her, the fact that alcoholism was the main character of her show and she made you laugh with it and she made you cry with it and she just took you all these places to let you know, you know, yeah, it was my best friend, but I beat it. Um, it's so poignant that, that uh, yeah, for me, that was like my ABC. So I'm, I'm very inspired by her. I love her because of the vulnerability. Yes. Um, so is that something that's scary for you then going in, knowing that for it to be probably good, you mm -hmm. have to be very vulnerable. You do. Honest. You do. And you have to ask yourself questions. And sometimes, you know, it's like whenever you create anything, whenever you write anything, if you're not talking about the truth, um, then why do it? You know, so you have to bring truth to anything and everything you do as a performer is almost like your duty, I feel. And so, um, yeah, it can be daunting, it can be hard, it can be a little intimidating as well, because like, do I really want to talk about this? Is this gonna... You always ask yourself that question. Is anyone gonna care? <laughs> but I think every artist asks themselves that question, you know, like who cares? Well, maybe they will, let's see. So you try things and, but ultimately it is about truth. I think we're all here in this so that our truth can perhaps um, help someone else. Yeah, and I think it's also like once you finally share your truth, maybe everybody won't receive it, but the people who are meant to receive it, receive it. Yeah. And that also feels good if you're, like you said, just connecting even with one person or two exactly. people, then that's sort of exactly. a joy in it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you make a resolution for 2020? I did. What was it? I forgot already. <laughs> what is it like this? I know it's the six. <laughs> um, what did I say? I think I think um, really take care of um, just take care of myself more. I think yeah. I think I was running on empty for a long time, uh, and and it, you know I just turned a very important age last year. I turned forty. Give it up for 40. Yeah, right? That's great. Yeah, I love 40. Oh, that's, um, and, and I thought, well, you know what? It's, it, it is now, I think I've been chasing and chasing and, ch and running and running. It's time now to really be selective and, and put more um, emphasis on the quality than the quantity. So that's 2020. The, the roaring 20s are going to be interesting. <laughs> Mine are going to be a calm 20s. Like, yeah, calm 20s. Uh, yeah, my right. actual 20s were worrying enough. Yeah. Like in my 30s, I just want to chill. Chill. Yeah, just that's what that's what this decade's for. Yeah. Uh, before we go, we do have a couple of questions. Okay. The first one comes from Twitter. Edward it is the man asks, what is your favorite episode of Fuller House? That's a tall order. Yeah, well, uh, I always say the same. I don't want to be boring, but my favorite episode of Fuller House was in season two, the Halloween episode where um, Kimmy and Fernando dress as Lucy and Ricky. Okay. And uh, I love that episode for all those reasons. The fact that I'm such a huge fan of Desi Arnaz mm -hmm. and Lucille Ball. And and I looked into Andrea's eyes and she looked exactly like Lucille. And um, and they gave us such a fun thing to do. And I got to sing for her. I love the I love Lucy theme. And I don't know, there was something really special there. I think that was really the beginning of, of our chemistry mm -hmm. Uh, that episode, so it will always be very, very special. Yeah, that's what I love when they actually give shows enough time, you know, because sometimes they'll end it in season one and you never really give those characters mm. time. Yeah. But I, I've seen with Fuller House, especially in like the second, third, fourth, those characters, like you just are so much more into the stories and yeah. the characters have grown and that, that connection is there. Yeah. Like you said, it's rare that a, a show that's redone gets five seasons. Mm -hmm. It's really a feat, an amazing right. feat. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, we do have another question. Yes. I have a question, Fernando. Yeah. Nice seeing you again. Hi. Um, my question is, on Fuller House, we see that uh, Ramona is starting to date. And so will we get to see in the last nine how Fernando navigates Ramona dating? Yes. <laughs> yes, he's a very, very jealous father, as you could imagine. And, um, yeah, there's there's more Ramona um, dating life. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I can say anything. So yes, you will. You will get a lot of that. A lot of that. Thank you. And last question. 
Hello, hey. Juan Pablo. How are you? Fine. Uh, I'm also a film actor from Uzbekistan, where you have a uh, huge army of fans, 32 million. Oh. And we have just one question for you on behalf of them. Uh, so you mentioned about that you had um, many ro uh, negative roles, like some bad guys. Just pretend, imagine, if you have a possibility uh, to play some historical negative guys in some movies, what kind of uh, person would you like to choose? And I hope at the end of this show I could shake your hand. Thank you. <laughs> so a negative historical yeah. negative figure. Negative historical, historical person. villain, basically. Yes. Ooh, that's a good one. So many to choose from. <laughs> Just one. Just one? Oh. Well, I don't know how negative Napoleon was. That, that's a fun one. But You're too tall. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but I would love to play the devil. Ooh. I would love to play the devil. I mean, I played, you know, Jesus, so... And I don't know if that's historical enough, but 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 it's in the realm of evil, um, for sure. Bold Evil's choice. Fun. Evil. Bold choice. You're like, ah, I'm just gonna play Satan. Yeah, I mean, the baddest one of them all, right? <laughs> Talking about historical villains, I think you just nailed it on the head right there. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm gonna wish that for you, I guess. You get to play the devil in 2020. In the meantime, I'm looking forward to the last nine episodes of Fuller House. And Thank congrats you. on everything you guys have been Thank able to you. do with the show. So you guys can check out those episodes on Netflix when they drop and check out his one man show, An Evening with Juan Pablo de Pache at the Green Room 42, playing on uh, January 9th and January 11th. And for more information for tickets, go to greenroom42.com. Put your hands together for Juan Pablo de Pache. Thank you. That was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you.